With a delicate hand and heart, Hilary Waters Vale turns a seemingly ordinary leaf into a work of art. Through her meticulous eye for detail and what must be an abundance of patience, she creates intricate botanical embroideries, or should I say, intricate embroideries on botanicals. In any case, the work created manages to slow the viewer down for a reprieve from our busy lives as we contemplate first the beauty and then appreciate the technique and skill that is shown. From elaborate couching to historic insertion stitching traditionally used to join fabric together in the decorative quilts of yesteryear. Hillary combines both the utilitarian and complex with the sublime simplicity of a humble leaf. Her meticulous blade skills are to be admired and the care that is taken as Hillary lovingly collects, presses and stitches each leaf, focusing on the sometimes remiss relationship humans have with plants. Hillary's collection of embroidered leaves is a celebration of what can be done when we are gentle and act with care. As the steward of the land and an active community member, Hillary has been involved in some large scale community projects. Hillary Waters Fowle received an MFA in Craft Material Studies from Virginia Commonwealth University and a BFA from Buffalo State College. She is an Assistant Professor and Head of the Fibre Area in the Department of Craft Material Studies at Virginia Commonwealth University. She has previously taught at Penland School of Craft and Mediterranean Art and Design Program Italy and Yassar University in Turkey. Her work has been widely exhibited and is held in both permanent public collections, including the United States Embassy in Colombo, Sri Lanka, and several private collections. A public installation and collaboration with the AK Museum can be seen year round in Buffalo, New York. It is our absolute pleasure to welcome Hillary to be a Friday feature artist today. So if you're joining us live, please leave a comment below and why not ask a question or two? So without further ado, let's get chatting with the beautiful Hilary Waters Fail. Hello. <laughs> That was such a beautiful intro. Thank you so much. You're most welcome. Well, it's beautiful work, absolutely beautiful work. So thank you for sharing it with us. That's a, I'm excited to talk to you. Yeah, me too. Thanks so much for the invitation to talk on this Friday night, Saturday morning. <laughs> yeah, it's always weird, isn't it? Yeah, so it's just gone 9 a.m. here in Melbourne. So we thought let's go a little bit early today and before people get out and we've all we've in Melbourne we've opened up now and and things are getting back to normal so we've got a beautiful market on today and people will probably be out shopping so it's nice to return to a bit of normality yeah absolutely yeah how was your thanksgiving oh, it was really lovely actually i got to see um, a good deal of my extended family up in buffalo and um, my partner's family here in virginia so it was really nice yeah. Oh, that's gorgeous. Are, well, are they too far away or is Buffalo and Virginia far away? Yeah, it is. It's uh, about a nine hour drive. Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 It's a small day. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we live in a big country, but nine hours, that's that's pretty long. Yeah. That's about <laughs> as far away as I want to live because it's still, you know, I can get home in a day, but um, it's, I love Virginia and I love the South. The weather's a lot warmer. Uh, here than where I grew up up there it's gets it really a lot of snow in the winter so yeah yeah oh well that's good I'm glad that you can still get there we've got family all over the place so as well um speaking of which Noni is my mother-in-law hello Noni <laughs> and uh, yeah it is lovely to see your beautiful work and gorgeous Susan hi Susan so yeah please leave a comment um and say hello and good morning or good evening to Hillary we'd love to hear from you and ask a question but to get the ball rolling, Hilary, how did you start doing what you're doing and, and how did your journey in textiles begin? Yeah, that's a great, um, that's a great question and I, I'll tell you the story and it is a little bit of a story, so hang in there. <laughs> okay. um, when I, I definitely, I always have related to um, wanting to make things even as a small child. So um, beyond just drawing and painting, I 
always felt this desire to make a thing. And I remember really wanting to whittle, you know, with a knife. Um, and my parents, I think, were not going to give me a knife. And so <laughs> a more accessible tool was a needle and thread. And my grandmother on my mother's side was, um, uh, she knit a lot. And so there was this sort of, you know, lineage of seeing this material um, and using it. And there was something about being able to stitch onto or into a piece of clothing, you know, or, or a, a pillowcase or something um, to create this just more beautiful moment in my life. And I really um, enjoyed that. So that's kind of the very beginning. And then as an older um, sort of teen tween, I went to this summer camp um, centered around the idea of teaching kids about the environment and about how to be a good steward of the land and how to take care of the resources around you. And so I became obsessed when I was there. It was kind of um, this amazing experience for me. And beyond just being outside and, and totally loving that experience and learning about nature and the land, uh, it opened my eyes to this possibility of having a career devoted to protecting that which I feel is most important. Um, which sounds silly, you know, saying that now that I didn't, but I just didn't realize it at that point. And so seeing these older people who were environmental scientists or, you know, botanist biologists um, going to school for forestry or environmental conservation, you know, specifically, um, that just kind of blew my mind. And it felt like maybe that was the most noble thing that one, you know, at that time that one could do with their life. Um, was to devote it to protecting the planet. And so with that kind of on my mind, I, I you know, grew up going through high school and then got to the age where I knew I was going to need to decide what I was going to do in college. And that, to me at the time, felt like this really big decision. Like, do I choose this path of art, which I've always loved, yeah. uh, or do I kind of go down this natural science um, path? And so I did end up choosing art um, and I went to Buffalo State College, as you mentioned before, for fiber design, for fabric design. And um, that sort of fell into my lap. So I, I did make that choice, but it also sort of just you know, came up and it was a wonderful opportunity to go to this um, school that was close to where my parents lived, but was also going to give me the opportunity to go and study abroad, um, which I feel just totally changed my life. You know, I, I went to school um, in my junior year in Manchester, England, and they had a specific program um, at Manchester Metropolitan University for embroidery. So at that point, so now I'm kind of like jumping forward in the story a little bit, but um, I go to this school for embroidery and become completely obsessed with specifically insertion stitching at that time. Um, but to kind of loop back to the story, all throughout this time as my you know, young teenager, from when I started going to that summer camp as a kid, I never really stopped. So every summer I would go back and either volunteer all summer long until I was old enough to start working there at age 18. And then I was working there every summer. So I came back from Manchester uh, and I went right to my job at the summer camp which was the camp cook that year. <laughs> and I actually had um, quite a bit of free time in between meals and I had a needle and thread with me. And so I was kind of casting around for something to stitch on. Um, and I just remember kind of looking through the kitchen, which I had access to obviously and thinking like, Oh, I don't, nothing in here is inspiring me at this moment. Maybe I'll go outside mm -hmm. and just see if there's anything out there. And, um, so I just looked up and saw this beautiful tree above me and I just thought, hey, maybe I'll try that. And uh, I did. And so, of course, that was kind of this um, amazing moment, um, which set me on a trajectory for the future. But I have to say, you know, even at that time, I just remember stitching that first leaf. And it, it of course, wasn't, it, you know, barely, it, it did it, but it was tough. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I do remember having it afterwards and just feeling like it was maybe the first thing that I've really, that I had made in my life that um, 
was really meaningful to me. Yeah. Uh, and so it was just this, you know, kind of, okay, this is what I need to be doing. Um, and sort of thinking about, you know, insertion stitching, which is um, both, you know, yes, there we go. So it's uh, traditionally meant to join two edges together and it's functional obviously in that joining action, but also decorative and beautiful. And so to me, this idea of using these joining stitches on the leaves was not just about, you know, joining leaves together, um, but maybe also about joining these two parts of my life together um, and, and more so nature and the human hand. And I think that's kind of the umbrella under which all of my work kind of falls now is talking about um, creating, you know, this connection or highlighting this connection between nature and the human hand. Oh. Well, that looks absolutely, it is, it's absolutely beautiful. I want to circle back on just something funny because you mentioned it. So our son loves, like he's a nature boy, loves to play with knives, right? So it's kind of quite the opposite to, to yeah. our upbringing, right? So Ollie's like, can we have a knife? And we're like, yeah, sure, grab a knife. Yeah, like, <laughs> um, but what happened was he actually stepped on a sewing needle and it went into his foot and he ended up in hospital having plastic surgery in his foot to get it out because oh it, it broke off. So let your parents know that sometimes sewing needles are more dangerous than knives. <laughs> That's so funny. Oh I know, right? Because when you said that, I was like, oh, it, it, it doesn't matter. You know, you try and keep your kids safe and, yeah. you know, <laughs> the sewing needle got him. <laughs> yeah, you hurt yourself with anything, really. <laughs> But I love the I love that idea of you know that nature camp and those summer schools and and how pivotal that can be for for young children in their development and pla literally planting that seed for you. I yeah, that was amazing. And how it how it sort of art found you in a way in that calling. But um, yeah, and studying in Manchester would have been a fantastic experience for you. How old were you when that happened? So I was um, probably uh, 20, 20, I think, um, 20 or 21, I can't remember. But, um, yeah, it was really, it was life-changing, definitely. It was very, very different than the experience I had at Buffalo, um, at the college in Buffalo. And having those two experiences kind of overlapping each other and overlay was just hugely important in the way that, um, I think I understood the approach to what it is to, to have a serious practice and to have, you know, discipline in, in what you want to do. Yeah, yeah. And being around, like, yeah, other people that are disciplined and other people who have that serious practice, it's not, it becomes, it becomes an art practice then, doesn't it? It becomes a professional practice. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's amazing. Well done. <laughs> I want to show some of your gorgeous leaves that, that you've got up here um, that you've shared with me. And what what are some of your favourite stitches, Hilary? Um, well, definitely, I mean, I, I told you I became really enamoured with those insertion stitches and there's something mm -hmm. about the the intricacy and the almost laciness of them that I think was initially really captivating to me. Um, and... I was making up a lot of the patterns myself, which, you know, I just at the time was really interested in doing that. Um, and so just kind of playing with the, the stitches and, and I guess making needle lace, you know, that's kind of um, was really interesting to me. But now I think I've moved on towards um, really wanting to do something a little bit more graphic. And you're sort of seeing that in some of the work that's um, in these photographs here. And what I've been using um, for the, all of these pieces that you're seeing is a couching stitch. Um, mm. And I used to hate couching stitches. This is black work in this image here, um, which also kind of, you know, it's sort of an interesting transition in between the insertion stitching and um, the couching, which is much more illustrative. But this black work, I really um, was kind of a, a wonderful in-between step for me. And it really pushed me to figure out a lot of things about how to work with this material and how to transfer images and designs um, and, and truly kind of what 
is possible as far as how small you can go <laughs> and, um, you know, how intricate the designs can be. Yeah. But yeah, so couching stitches, I, you know, primarily are using those at this point. And um, I find that uh, just due to the nature of the material, the leaves, typically, um, a couching stitch works fantastically. And I think I always kind of, uh, I, I didn't gravitate towards the couching stitches at all. I, it was like my least favorite stitch when I first learned how to embroider. And I just thought, why would anyone do that? <laughs> um, but, you know, I figured out it actually makes a, a lot of sense. And it's a way to get a beautiful solid line um, without actually putting too much tension on the material itself. So it works wonders for me. <laughs> Uh, that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Because with a couching stitch, I'm not an embroiderer, but you, you lay something down and then you stitch over the top of it to attach it. Exactly. Yeah. You kind of lay it down and then you're tacking it in place. And so, you know, in the way that maybe a, a back stitch, which kind of loops through, but where it's looping through, you're putting a lot of pressure on that material that's in between. And so with a fabric or, you know, that's, it's no problem because there's that weave structure to hold everything place um, mm -hmm. but with something that might tear or is really fragile that you know it's just gonna go Whoop. <laughs> so um, that's not a you know I had to figure out different ways of, of using stitches to get the the kind of look that I wanted yeah well it's certainly resonating with people Patricia, Patricia says fantastic embroidery and beautiful intricate work it is so beautiful hi Janet um, yeah, so many metaphors there is. Yeah. You've got people from all over the world watching too, um, Hilary. You've got Shirley from New Zealand, Lisbeth from Denmark. Yeah, love yes. the embroidery. And as well. Well, as well. That's wonderful. <laughs> I want to get to your process and um, what, yeah, what what is your actual process? So do you do does the design come first does the leaf come first um how do you press your work how do you prepare the leaves are you happy to share that yeah definitely um i think well certainly i think the inspiration probably comes first and so absolutely i'm inspired by a lot of natural patterns um and just things that i see in the world um there's a lot of patterns that i've been using lately that are kind of inherent in um, fungi, you know, the, um, the gills of fungi or, oh, yeah. um, you know, different, you know, cellular structure also kind of zooming in on a micro scale has, has yeah. been really interested and in, in inspiring lately. Um, so there's that, but then also I'm of course very, very inspired by looking at historical textiles and the, pa you know, patterns in, um, the decorative arts, you know, throughout history, um, and so I love drawing. That's a huge part of my process. I keep a sketchbook close to me at all times. <laughs> and, um, you know, I love, I love to draw. And so I'll kind of be drawing and then I'll decide, okay, this is a design maybe I want to move on to stitch because um, unless it's something that you're really committed to, <laughs> it does take quite a bit of time and patience. And so um, I don't like to stitch something that I feel kind of meh about. Um, and then I'll go outside and um, generally, you know, with, with respect um, for the plants or the trees that I'm taking from, sometimes I take uh, leaves that have fallen on the ground and sometimes leaves that are still on the plant or the tree. But I always try to think about being a good plant ally and, you know, never take too much from one plant or one tree. This is actually, I'll just mention really quickly, this is in Sicily um, and it's one of the 10 oldest living trees in the world. Um, oh, wow. Anywhere between two and 4,000 years old, this chestnut tree, right oh, on this wow. um, Mount Etna, which is a volcano, an active volcano. So um, what a gift it was to be able to visit that tree. But yeah. so I will just go kind of outside choose my material and I am kind of particular about the types of leaves that I use. Um, and that's of course, if I'm just working you know, for myself, sometimes I'll work with someone who might want a 
a leaf that comes from a particular tree mm-hmm. or plant, you know, something from their own, the you know, farm where they grew up or um, a, a, a gravesite or a cemetery where a loved mm-hmm. one is, you know. And so I think plants really are a marker of place and, and people and memory. And so um, they hold a lot of importance and meaning. But regardless, so I get my leaf and then I bring it back to the studio and depending on what it is, um, I might press it first if it's uh, a more delicate leaf and I might just work with it fresh if it's kind of a a tough waxier leaf. Um, I do work with them both ways, definitely. And um, either way, regardless of whether I'm working with it fresh or pressed, during the process of stitching it, usually I don't sit down and do a piece start to finish just because um, it's a lot of hours and, you know, I don't sit for 12 to 20 hours, zero to, you know, whatever it takes longer sometimes um, at, a, at a stretch. So I'll, I'll press it in between always um, just because you don't, you know, want that. As soon as you start puncturing it, you're creating um, a, a place where moisture is going to start leaving the leaf, even if it seems like it's already mostly dried. And so if you don't press it, you're kind of um, creating an opportunity for the leaf to curl up in really funny ways. So I will always press um, throughout while I'm working on it. And I usually just, for that part of the process, we'll just keep it um, flat between blotting paper and and heavy books on my desk um, or, you know, that's, that's pretty much what I always do, actually. <laughs> um, and then, uh, so the design, let's say, like, I have my design in my sketchbook. So to transfer it out of my sketchbook, I'll usually make, uh, take a piece of trace paper, tracing paper, and draw that. Um, I might also just draw it freehand on the leaf itself. You know, I, I work in a lot of different ways, but... yeah. Um, So sometimes some leaves can be drawn right onto um, with specific pens and what pen that is. I can't tell you because it's literally different for different leaves. Like some leaves have a really waxy surface that will take, you know, certain things. But I've learned never to use a Sharpie or permanent marker because that does tend to bleed through after a while, even if it's a fine tip. Um, So it's got to be kind of a, you know it takes a a little while to figure out what's going to work with what, but I tend not to do that anymore as much. So what I do more often than that is, like I said, to trace the design or get the design on some kind of paper. Maybe I'll just draw it right on the paper and then I'll take that paper and um, I might even have an image or a a piece in here that I have that I can show you. Um, But I'll put that over the leaf. And then I will take my extra special fancy needle tool, which is here. And it is a wine, <laughs> cork, a wine cork with a needle in it. Um, and I'll tra- you know, prick the whole design out. Um, and so then I'll have kind of an outline on the leaf of where I want my design to be, what I want it to look like. And once I have that done, I can start stitching. And I'm wow. just trying find if I you know oh I do have okay so I have um here on in the sketchbook I don't know how hard it is to see here yeah, we can see. yeah so I've got this you know I've traced the leaf and then the design itself and um then I've gone through and actually pricked the whole design which is hard to see both of these designs actually were um something that I pricked and then was able to go ahead and Ditch that yeah I think that must be such an important part of the process is that pre we'll call it pre-pricking <laughs> the pricking before because I, I honestly when I look at your work I don't know how you have the patience like I do you, like where does your patience come from <laughs> <laughs> um I, <laughs> I don't know I do I mean I wouldn't actually characterize myself as an incredibly patient person but yeah. um For certain things I do, you know, it's like, I just, you can get into it. You get obsessed by seeing how close you can get those stitches or what if I use this color right next to that color, what is that going to look like? It's like, 
the excitement of it kind of keeps you going um, and keeps you engaged. But yeah, I mean, certainly it's a painstaking process. And um, in some of the work you've seen, it's not just one, you know, I'll do the line and then go around both sides of the line with a different color. And so in essence, you're pricking the whole design once, which it, that's like a traditional way that you might um, transfer a pattern on fabric is like the prick and pounce. Um, so using like, once you've pricked it, you'd be able to use uh, chalk or something to go through the holes and see the design. But of course on the leaf, you can't really do that. So it's just the holes in the back. And I will end up holding that up to the light sometimes to see where the next stitch is that I'm supposed to be, you know, which direction I'm going in after this yeah. particular um, so that initial round of getting the embroidery in place does actually take quite a, quite a bit of time. Yeah, that, that's so fascinating. Um, our friend, sorry, Philip asked as well. So, yeah, hi, Philip. It's important to have, you know, is it important to have a leathery type of leaf? Um, so we've spoken about um, preparing the leaf, but do, do you have to prepare the thread in any way before you stitch the leaf? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, so I don't always use, I mean, certainly a, a leathery or waxy leaf is a lot easier to use. Um, and certain leaves like eucalyptus leaves when they dry become so brittle um, and so thick that they're actually really difficult to use. And so I tend to use those when they're fresh. It just really depends on the leaf itself. Um, for the, the thicker leaves like magnolia trees or camellia or you know, eucalyptus here, um, those are great. I use them fresh, I use them pressed. Um, but then we have a lot of deciduous trees as well, which um, they, when they drop their leaves, they're only, the leaves are only meant to be around for one season. And so they're a lot more delicate generally. And those leaves sometimes are, um, just fragile enough that I need to put a skin on the back of them to make them a little bit more, um, I, I guess, stronger to be able to withstand what I'm doing to them. And so I'll use an archival um, book binding glue for that. Um, and the thread itself, I don't use, I don't do anything special to it. Um, I just use regular thread that's either you know vintage that I've had someone's given me or I, a lot of times I just use DMC thread these days um which I have you know loads and loads of at this point so I do buy a lot from garage sales or thrift stores sometimes um there's like lots and lots of those old um kits for maybe sewing or, or embroidering like a tea towel or something and mm -hmm. so I'll buy the someone didn't do it <laughs> and all the thread is there and so I'll <laughs> buy that um yeah I love using vintage materials when I can. yeah Victoria asked um do you, do you like about the threads as well but do, do you use silk threads does that do they work beautifully um so I have some silk I have some synthetic thread I have some cotton and to be honest and metallic I have these beautiful Japanese um metallic threads that I um have been kind of falling in love with recently as well but um I use a lot of cotton to be honest and I feel like the the silk sometimes can just be so slick and so slippery that it um does things that I don't want it to do and so I just feel like sometimes the cotton actually just holds firm to where I want it to be. It has a beautiful luster still, so it reflects light um, in a really lovely way. And I love I love using it. So yeah, yeah. Gorgeous. Thank you for sharing that. That's great. That's so fantastic. So Marilyn just said, do the prick holes, they become the stitch holes. So yes. Yeah. Uh, they As do well. sometimes. They do sometimes, yeah. but they don't always. More so they just act as an outline for me to know what comes next. Ah, okay. Yeah, perfect. 
enjoying your art explanation. That's lovely. Thank you. <laughs> your, your fine cut work. Um, we work with a beautiful collage artist called uh, Cordula Caveman and she does a lot of what like paper cutouts and she uses them as overlays on her artwork. And I wanted to post a couple of your images into her group saying, guys, if you're looking at um, cutout inspiration, you must look at Hillary's work. Absolutely amazing. And just the detail in it. What, what started on on that trajectory? Like there's an image here which I just find divine, um, yeah. this one here. Was this something that that just came naturally to just do the cutouts rather than doing the, the stitch? Yeah, I mean, it's funny because they're completely opposite in the, you know, a sti stitch is additive and uh, cutting is reductive. <laughs> so yeah. it's like the opposite way of working. But um, cut cut work had always been kind of interesting to me because I had always been really um, enamored with the look of block prints. And so in try I would you know look at a block print and then try to draw it and figure out, okay, so I'm only drawing the part of the block that would remain and how is it connected? You know, so just thinking about it that way and then um, that translated really beautifully into cut work, so cut paper work, which um, I just, I don't know, I just have always loved it. And so I, of course, had to try it with leaves too. <laughs> um, the leaves, you know, it's, uh, although I can cut whatever I want, I really do enjoy taking a lot of the inspiration from the leaf itself um, and kind of just playing with what, is there because there is such an inherent beauty to the material already um, that you know in in just kind of being able to do something as simple as just take some of the material away um, and kind of show this other side of, of what's just there yeah it's beautiful it's absolutely beautiful i love that that really the leaf tells you what it wants yeah it, what it needs and <laughs> just respectfully do that now i've noticed that there's a lot of ginkgo leaves and my mother-in-law noni loves ginkgo <laughs> she's oh actually hang on let me show you something okay noni you're gonna you're gonna hate me no she'll love it um so this is she does um oh. on eco dyed fabric and then that's her gorgeous ginkgo. yeah isn't that beautiful noni that's so gorgeous. I love yeah. that. Yeah, and she does a, she's done a beautiful series, all different colour pattern, all different colourways, blacks, whites, beautiful turquoises, but I I, I, I managed to sneak this oh, in. Oh, this <laughs> line work, you know, the way that those stitches just translate into the line work. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. Is there, I've noticed there's a lot of ginkgo work for you as well. Is there a significance for that leaf for you or is it symbolic in some way? I mean, I've always just, I've always thought they're such gorgeous. I think a lot of people do, you know, they're just mm. these beautiful fan-like shapes. And then there's absolutely nothing like seeing that tree in the fall, just oh. such intense gold and they all fall at the same time. It's just kind of a, there's magic to it, you know, and I think using something that already has this inherent magic kind of, you know, you're, you're latching onto that in some way. Um, but certainly I think, you know, people love them and I love them. And so I can't help myself when I walk by a tree, you know, to maybe take one leaf or if there's lots on the floor, you know, take, pick up some. Um, but certainly not necessarily. I mean, I love, they're an ancient organism. And I think, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot there. Um, and they're just a magnificent, really magnificent leaf. So they are, they tend to be very fragile though. And the, the veins, they just, you know, if you've ever played with one, they just want to split down those veins. And so that was kind of one of the first leaves that prompted me to figure out a way to work with a material that really um, doesn't want to have lots of holes poked in it. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, but there, a couple of um, images ago, there were those, um, pieces with the designs on them that are not stitched, they're actually just bruised um, or their impressions. Yeah, those. Um, and that was uh, just a way of playing, a different way of playing with the material and playing with the leaf. And that happened when I saw, um, you know, again, 
in the fall, loads of them just drop. And someone had ridden their bike through this, you know, golden carpet of leaves. And mm -hmm. there were bike, the bike tires had bruised this pattern. Um, and so I thought, oh my gosh, like maybe I could play with that. Maybe I could try that myself. And so these were just using, uh, I think the one on the left was using like the end of a skeleton key just to make impressions. And the one on the right was um, just a drawing I did with a, with a hairpin, a bobby pin. Right. Oh, wow. That's gorgeous. And that simple, just, yeah, right. I cannot, that's what I love about artists is, and creative people is that we see things that other people just wouldn't see, you know, like the simple tire track on a leaf. And then that's, that's opened up a new, a new line of sort of discovery for you. I think that that's amazing. So. Yeah. yeah. It's a way of keeping it fresh too. You know, it's like it's nice to play with a material in a different way. Yeah, is that your cat playing up, is it? Yeah, she's like, hang on one second. <laughs> Hillary has a gorgeous black cat and it, it made a cameo before um, we got started talking. So. She really is uninterested in doing anything other than sleeping until I'm on a Zoom call or some sort of <laughs> where I'm talking. <laughs> yeah, they're narcissistic, those little things. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, we've got a few questions, if you don't mind. Um, Philippa asked, uh, do you knot when starting to stitch? Thanks, Philippa. Um, I do typically, unless I'm working um, with something, mm, I would say almost always I do. Um, I don't always knot when I finish, though, because the thread gets to be so thick on the back. Um, and so kind of crisscross, I'm not a neat embroiderer in any way on the back. And what I can do is just tuck those in and the tension of everything holds it all in place. Yeah, perfect. Um, Victoria has asked, you mentioned pressing the leaves between stitching sessions. How do you store or display them when you have finished? That's a great question. Yeah, that was a great question. Um, so I do, as soon as they're finished, I do press them completely um, and for, for a long time, you know, and that varies, you know, if it was already pressed when I started, it might be less. Um, but basically until I'm ready to frame them, and I do typically frame them just because um, they're organic materials that haven't, you know, they're ephemeral in some ways, but their life will be extended um, probably to last longer than I will. Um, but they will be, you know, framed in uh, archival material, you know, like I use an archival mat board and then they're kind of um, spaced and then the glass on top is museum quality, usually with uh, UV protection. So they're protected from the sunlight, they're protected from, you know, air and bugs and dust. And so they really probably will last quite a while. But the fact that they'll break down eventually, I think, is still kind of important to me. Uh, just, you know, that's, what, that's what's meant to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like the whole saying that, you know, like you see a lot of people, like it's probably just my excuse for not raking up leaves, but I always say, well, they call them leaves for a purpose. Just leave them alone. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they're meant they actually become the soil. Yeah. So <laughs> leave them. <laughs> yeah, you should. And <laughs> yeah. Um, Anne Bull mm -hmm. asked, hi Anne. Um, if you're out walking, do you do you see a leaf and then the result in your head or oh that's not a silly question at all. Yeah, no, it's a great question. <laughs> Definitely certain shapes kind of lend themselves uh, so beautifully to certain types of designs and just, yeah, sometimes the color of a leaf or the shape or the pattern of the veins, will ju I'll just, you know, see it and be really excited to do something in particular. Um, but not always, you know, I have to say that's not usually the way I work. It does happen sometimes, but more often than not, it's this kind of bringing things back together in the studio and figuring out how they're going to be combined together. Yeah. Yeah. Are the ginkgo leaves fresh or dried when you work on them? I think you mentioned, briefly mentioned that. Both. Both. I've done both. Mm -hmm. um, so those green ones that I have, um, I usually are, are fresh and then the yellow ones are dried. 
So these are the green ones. Mm -hmm. They're beautiful. Mm -hmm. More comments. Hang on. Hang on. I'm getting to them. <laughs> Oh, uh, Shirley asked, maybe I missed it, but what type of threads are you using? So, yes, you spoke about threads, only embroidery threads. Do you ever use wax book binding thread? I'd imagine it'd be a bit bit hard or? Yeah, the more pliable and flexible the thread is, the better. But um, staying away from thread that is, so I had very thin synthetic thread um, that almost was, it was so fine and so strong that it would, kind of slice through the leaves and so that was not the best um and so that's kind of why i have just come around to using cotton dmc and i split it down to be you know one or two threads and then i'm using a super duper teeny tiny needle um i don't know if you can see here but it is you know very yeah. very small um the yeah. size 12 between needle it's called um and they are, I mean, <laughs> I glazed over this part, but maybe the hardest part of the whole thing is threading those darn needles. <laughs> <laughs> and I keep them here. I have this like kind of crazy looking um, <laughs> situation with all my needles because I'll thread them to be much longer than you would typically want to work with um, an embroidery thread. Just because it's so hard to thread them, I need to get, you know, get enough on there and then so I, when I'm doing, you know, a bigger project or something, I'll thread it pretty much as long as my arm reaches. And then I know that at least I've got it threaded because the holes are so small that a needle threader doesn't even go through them. Uh, so to get two threads, which is what I typically use for the top, um, the top line width is two of those threads together. And then the tacking thread is just a single thread. So to get two through the hole, sometimes it's like, Okay, I did it. <laughs> just like um. <laughs> you, you're, and you're only young to wait until you have to start getting glasses. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Very lucky to have good vision still. Yeah, you'll be fine. You'll be, you'll, you'll be, you'll be right. <laughs> but yeah, I can imagine. I find that quite frustrating as well. Threading a needle. Yeah, some people just just do it. They can just bloop, bloop, and it's done. And yeah, I can imagine with such fine, fine, fine needles, they would get lost in someone's foot. Definitely, yes, they definitely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Nancy asked, um, "Do you use a waist knot when you start?" Thanks, um, I do not. So I do, I almost always use just a. In to be honest, a single knot in a single thread is usually enough because the needles are so thin that they don't, the hole that they make is usually um, so tiny that a single knot will do it. And so there's no, you know, I just tend to leave the knot uh, in place, trim it off really tight and then, um, yeah, I leave it. And so I try never actually to start around the edge of something where you're gonna be able to see that knot. Um, I tend to work, you know, from the center out. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. And Shirley also says thank you so much. Now, you've been collaborating with nature, but you also collaborate with communities and do a lot of community projects. And, and I get the feeling that you, you love working with people and it's, it's, it's about that connection. One of, the, one of the ones that is featured on your website, which is those beautiful sienna types and the the resulting artwork from that. Can you tell us a little bit about the, uh, what was it called? It was called the botanicals. Um, the, botan blueprints. Yeah. the botanical blueprints. Yeah. I love that. Can you tell us a little bit about working with the community and how art brings people together? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I do feel kind of strongly about the fact that art is for everyone, you know, and so um, being able to make public art or make a project that's meant for for everyone is <laughs> amazing and so exciting. It was just amazing. So um, I did this project a couple of years ago in Buffalo where I'm from, and it was in collaboration with uh, the garden walk. So people are out enjoying gardens and this is before the pandemic. So everyone's out and out and just enjoying the community and enjoying everyone's um, gardens and outdoor space. And so I did this in a couple different locations throughout the city. Um, 
And people were invited to come over to me and to make a print, a cyanotype print, which is um, using, it's a, the original way of making a blueprint uh, before we had computers and copiers. And it's basically the, the, you're using a coating of iron salts on paper. And so when you put these two iron salts together, they become uh, UV sensitive. So they're sensitive to sunlight. And then when you put something on top of them, you're essentially creating a, what's called a photogram. And so that's a shadow. You know, you're, you're putting your hand on the paper. There's a shadow of your hand where the sunlight is not touching. And so when you expose it to the sun for a couple minutes and then take it back inside or just rinse it off really quickly, um, anything that was not exposed to the sunlight is just going to rinse away. And so you have this really um, gorgeous, you know, blue, dark, uh, color where the sunlight touched it and then anything that is not touched is just becomes the color of the paper as that um, the rest of that solution gets washed away. And so being able to do this uh, and invite people to make prints of plants so they could bring plants from their own gardens, they could bring, um, you know, just use a, a plant that's, you know, from the grass or from the trees around or um, we have lots of plants there that people could use as well. Common plants from, um, you know, that you would find in a garden and plants that would be natural to that area and plants that would be totally exotic. And so that is kind of what happens in a garden, right? We bring, we have plants from all over the place and we bring them together into this environment because we find them beautiful or they're useful or, you know, yeah. they give us food or, you know, whatever the reason, lots of different reasons. Mm. But that's kind of also the way that a city works, you know, like everyone is coming together from all over the place. And then you have this really vibrant community. And so the, the plants that were being printed in different areas of the city were really interesting and reflective of different communities. So there were different, um, like a very strong, uh, different like refugee communities in certain areas. And so they had totally different plants. And it was amazing to see and to hear about these different plants and where they came from and you know how they were used and um so that was just a wonderful project and then the culmination of that was um that mural that you saw of the cyanotypes um yeah exactly so that was a wonderful project and i think something about this process that i i do use it quite frequently now the cyanotype process um there's kind of this wonderful thing to me about the whole thing, this connection to um, obviously earth and, and plants, but all of it is possible because of the sunlight. You know, the plants grow the sunlight and the paper that we're printing on is typically cotton and that's coming from a plant. And then the, the whole process itself, you know, would not be possible without light from the sun. And so I love that connection. A funny story. We were like at a live workshop once and somebody, um, beautiful Sienna type artist from, from England was uh, teaching and it was just so cloudy the whole week and it was really dark and they're like, come on, we need the sun. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's so stressful. <laughs> I know, I know, especially when they've come all the way from England. And, yeah. You know, it's yeah. like, this is Australia, like, where is the sun? Yes. <laughs> so, but obviously this, this the translation of the set cyanotypes was done in paint. Is that, that correct? Like on the wall? These are yeah. the bricks. Yeah. Yeah. I cannot take credit for that. That was the incredible uh, work of the, the, um, people I was working with at the Albright Knox Museum that they, they, I mean, it looks stunning. It looks yeah. exactly like prints and just, you know, even some of them have this like strange shadow from the way that the leaves were printed. Just yeah. Like I saw that kind of here. Yeah. 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 They've done an amazing job, print, like paint, like translating them back into paint. Yeah. Yep. And you, so you took all everybody. So, so the, the community member um, took took a print with them home and you kept a print and then you scanned the prints in and then created this digital collage. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And the collage, you know, the grid obviously is just an easy way to get to have, you know, everyone's basically has a quality there. And it also kind of reminds me of um, a quilt, you know, a friendship yeah. quilt. And 
where everyone's kind of contributing a square to make this larger, this larger thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Another one of your Sienna types that I had a little spy on your website and we've just put a link up to your website by the way everybody should check it out it's beautiful there's some lovely things for sale and you'll you'll just love it but you're gorgeous I call them mandalas but I'm trying to figure out how you did that did you place (laughs) what is the magic behind this So this, the process for this um, basically looks like me going out into um, the, you know, wherever location. Um, these, this whole piece was done um, at a, from the botanical gardens of this beautiful residency called Hortus Gardens. And that's in um, the Catskills region of New York state. And they have, you know, I went in October of 2020. And so they just have this gorgeous, you know, fall, like was all around me. And so it's like this beautiful oranges and reds, and then some of the leaves were still green. So I went around and collected leaves, which was part of what I was able to do with this, um, you know, with this residency and the permission to collect. And so I'm going out every day and collecting my, you know, Tupperware (laughs) containers full of uh, leaves and then bringing them back in the evening and basically, you know, clipping them from their stems or doing whatever I'm doing and laying them all out on um, wax paper or blotting paper and then layering in between cardboard so that I could take them home and press them. So every, all the leaves are pressed. And then once they're completely dry, um, I'm taking them and moving them onto a piece of um, clear acrylic sheet. So this arrangement is literally leaf by leaf Hold and put onto um, the acrylic and glued yeah. into place, and then I'm using that as the the printing plate to make this cyanotype on the right there. See. Wow, it's it's just stunning. I knew that you wouldn't be placing it twice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but this didn't look like that was on. Um, it didn't look like it was on, it looked like it was placed on paper. I couldn't tell that it was um, on the acrylic, but yeah, that makes it, that makes absolute sense. Yeah. Yep. Um, gorgeous Susan, she says, yeah, she was in that work. It was Hannah Lamb was the artist. Oh, okay. Oh, it was all it was all well in the end. I remember the sun came out and then like literally there was like a like a mass exodus from the classroom. Oh, People oh, ran outside like, ah, oh, with their plates and it was fantastic. Oh, that's so funny. It was. It was really, really great. Oh, yeah, that's a great uh, question, Philippa. What size is the mandala? Um, so I've done up to right in, um, okay, so a couple things. My car cannot fit. <laughs> <laughs> I have a station wagon, but still. Um, I made a piece that was 48 by 48 inches, which is, you know, four feet by four feet, which probably, you know, you can't actually – conceptualized very easily because (laughs) you know that's about this big um and that is uh probably the biggest size that I can buy in the acrylic sheeting before you know you have to um go up to like extra large size so that kind of is my limit for now um, to like how big they are but the piece that you were looking at before was um I believe 24 by 24 inches. So, you know, two feet by two feet ish. So a little bit smaller than the circle behind you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's quite large. But when you look at this, when you look at the leaves, then you, cause it looks like they're miniature. It looks like miniature leaves. Yeah. Like when you're looking at the image, but yeah, that's quite large. That's big. Yeah. That's right. Phil Phil goes, wow. <laughs> Yeah, and they, I mean, they are, you know, some of the leaves are smaller, but they're, it's the arrangement of them too, you know, they're all tucked into each other and um, they kind of fit together really well, which is, you know, part of it, part of what I love about building these is just finding these patterns that sort of just everything fits together and it it tends to just be, um, for me, it feels like a metaphor of just interconnectivity and um, you know, everything fitting together in this way and, you know, getting so, so small in the center, but then just expanding, expanding, expanding. Um, yeah. 
I think that's gorgeous. You can see like when um, I saw that work and then before we went live, I said to Hilary, oh, have you, do you know of an artist called Shona Wilson? And she also does um, beautiful collaborations with nature and, and mandalas come out of that as well. And, and she raises things off the, off the surface. So I thought, oh, yeah, you must check out her work as well. It, it was, yeah, such beautiful now, because we live in Australia and um, I've got a bit of an obsession with snakes because we've got one living in our backyard, I just want to touch base with your snake scale artwork as well and just to show people that because, I, I mean, they're beautiful artworks in themselves, but then when you realise they're actually scales. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> what, what possessed you to work with snake scales? I mean, that's a little bit of a long story too, so I'll tell it quickly, but... Um actually started working with the feathers first. And um, feathers. so mm -hmm. this is made with the feathers of a crow and it actually, you know, looks quite a lot like a, a, an ink drawing or a line drawing, but it's, um, you know, each individual thread or barb of that feather pulled off with tweezers, extremely fine tweezers and then dipped in glue and uh, laid down on the paper. So I started doing this, um, uh, right after I had uh, a dear friend of mine had passed away totally unexpectedly and it just started making me think about um, when something is there or present in your life but it's no longer recognizable so like having you know these memories of you know my, my friend or, or a loved one my grandmother also passed away right at the same time um, and so there you know that's like all of the notes of the song are still there. The, the whole feather is still there, but it's just rearranged in this way that would be totally unrecognizable. Um, and so that's kind of what prompted me to start doing this. Um, and I started using uh, different types of feathers, which uh, I found out after I would started, it was actually illegal because of the Protective Migratory Bird Act, which is a way, way, way long ago law here in the United States. Um, to protect the birds, you know, which mm. is totally necessary and I wouldn't want to go against that. So now I'm just, I just use chicken feathers or, you know, the types of fe turkey feathers, game fowl um, that are mm. legal to have. But the snake scales kind of came, you know, right after that. And just thinking about um, snake scales as snakes are such symbolic and beautiful creatures, you know, they have this thinking about the Ouroboros and the circle. And so circles also have become really important to me and sort of obviously you've seen that in Mandala and some of the work I've done, but um, thinking about this line that just connects to itself and the way that, you know, energy never leaves um, and just keeps coming back around in different ways. But the snake scales are treated in much the same way. So it's peeling this, this shed skin apart um, scale by scale and then dipping it into glue and then to the paper. So just playing with these shapes and playing, you know, the shapes of the scales themselves and the colors of the scale, even, you know, in a, in a single snake, the scales shift size and shift color and they're all different. So it's kind of an amazing material to, to play with. And people tend to send me things, which is amazing. So I just got this incredible box a couple uh, months months ago from someone who just has been collecting things from nature her whole life and was downsizing in her house and just thought maybe I would want them. And so she sent me this incredible box of snake skins and feathers and insect wings and just the treasures that she has found. And, you know, I certainly have my own too, but it's just amazing to have this shared connection with people and so people do save snake skins for me and send them and then I have this treasure trove of <laughs> amazing material to work with which I feel so grateful for. Yeah I love that about the art communities that we're so generous and we share so many things with each other and and you do you see something on the ground and it reminds you of somebody or um yeah, I know certainly I was out in the backyard today and I was like looking at our, I just collected some of our gum leaves. So like just the colours and, you know, they're obviously too dry to, to stitch into or anything, but I was thinking I just thought I'll put them on my desk today because I'll, I'll be, you know, it'll, I'll be channeling leaf talk. Um, 
But I thought I'd start off with something small, though, if I was going to do it, and so I collected this one. (laughs) Elephant ear. Love those. (laughs) So I might just sit here and fan myself. (laughs) Um, But, no, in my little office it sits, I've got a big elephant ear and um, that sits right outside and it it just grows huge. And I thought, well, maybe I'll start small with the embroidery. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I love that. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, Hilary, it has been such a pleasure talking to you. I can't believe we've been chatting over an hour, well, almost an hour. Um, I always ask um, people to to leave a comment at the end and just, just show their gratitude. We've had, like, yeah, amazing attendance today. So thanks, everybody. I know it's Christmas time and everybody's got things to do and I think it's just lovely to slow down, reconnect with nature, um, I think it, for me, I'm always telling myself that Christmas is a beautiful time to connect with family and slow down and just remember that it is a bit of a false deadline. Yeah, <laughs> you know? At the same time, it's just another day, so don't put too much pressure on everybody and yourselves to have everything yeah. done and dusted by Christmas. It's just a day. Yeah. But <laughs> what, what, when it comes to your artwork and your art practice, what, what are you most proud of, Hilary? Um, hmm. I mean, I think, I think probably I'm most proud of being able to say what is the most important, you know, it it sort of goes back to what I was talking about in the beginning with, um, it's truly a gift to be able to kind of talk about what I feel like is the most important thing, which is, um, just acting with respect and care towards this planet that we all live on um, and and being able to sort of make a statement about that in my work um, and to be able to make something that maybe um, gives someone a a second, you know, shift someone's perception of something. Um, There's this quote that I really love and it's by um, John O'Donohue, who is an Irish um, philosopher and poet and he said that beauty is that in the presence of which you feel more alive and it's something that I think about a lot and it's always running through my mind um and not you know that's certainly aspirational you know to to think that that's what I'm doing is definitely like not (laughs) not it but it is something that I I think about and I you know I try to make something that would start to to go to that place of of making someone feel differently about their life or making someone feel just something different. Yeah. 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 Well, you've certainly given us plenty of beautiful moments today and you will ongoing as we follow along in your journey and you're so young and so talented and I just can't wait to see where it takes you. Do you ever think about the future too much or you just, just stay in the present and just see where it takes you? I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, I just try to remember that every day is a gift and I don't, I'm not, it's so unpredictable, you know, what can happen. So I'm, I'm here in the moment and who knows. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for these beautiful moments that you've shared with everyone today. Um, everyone's popping their comments in um, to say thank you. We're going to play a little slideshow just to end and I'll put those comments up for you and you can um, have a little read and um, realise. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, that's okay. Thanks for coming today. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Yeah, on this um, gorgeous Saturday morning and Friday evening in the States, it's just um yeah, it's incredible. So hang on the line, Hillary, afterwards, and I'll say a quick goodbye. Um, and thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you. We've got one more to do before the end of the year, and then we're going to sign off for a few for a few weeks and um, enjoy some family time. So, um, yeah, it's exciting. <laughs> see ya. <laughs>